Hello everyone. Um, my name is Matthias Niesner. It's a pleasure to be here at the Media Forensics Workshop at CVPR 2020. Um, today I'm going to talk about deepfakes and forgery detection and I'm going to present some of our research both for the creation of artificial and synthetic videos but also um, how can we detect them. And of course, you know, the reason why, you know, for instance, this workshop is relatively popular is because there's a lot of ongoing discussion um, about synthetic media. Um, specifically, one of the terms that has been mentioned many, many times is the term deepfakes. And um, nowadays I'm going to start mostly my talks with first explaining what is actually a deepfake. Um, and this is actually something that is not always so clear. I mean, um, there's certain groups that define deepfakes this way, certain groups that define it that way. Um, so I always wanted to make a quick introduction how it actually originated. So traditionally speaking, um, deepfakes is a thing that appeared in the last few years. Um, and it is typically associated with face swapping. So the idea here is um, you're basically taking two videos, right? You're taking the face of one video and pasting it on the other video. Um, and deepfakes, the term actually appeared from this GitHub repository that I'm linking here. Um, this GitHub account um, actually was kind of the, the originator um, to call these videos deepfakes. And then it got picked up by the, by the news, by the media. Um, and now, um, you know, this has been kind of a term um, for these kind of videos. However, I also wanted to highlight what maybe deepfakes are not necessarily. And there's like these two categ categories in terms of facial reenactment and facial editing of videos. So there's the face swapping that I just described, and there's also facial reenactment. So again, to reiterate, if you're talking about face swapping, um, the idea is we have two people. In this case, we have here, um, we have here uh, one person, right? And we have a, a a, tar uh, a source phase, and we want to copy the source phase onto the target videos, right? So this is the original phase, and it gets replaced with her face, and this is then the resulting output video. And this is what um, what the deepfake method is doing. Um, this one, however, is not to be confused with facial reenactment. So facial reenactment means I'm going to take the video of her, I'm going to take the expressions from a different video, and I'm going to change the smile the way she's going to look like. Right? But it's not changing the identity, it's still the same person. It's just changing what that person is, for instance, saying, how the mouth is moving, and I imagine of the face. So deep fakes, traditionally speaking, is, is in this category. Um, however, I also want to say that, you know, in the media this has been often confused and, you know, has been a bit mixed up. Um, and sometimes you see that everything that is kind of synthetically generated is a deep fake. Like every, every movie is a deep fake and whatsoever. But in practice, I would say, um, academically speaking, um, the identity swapping, the face swapping part, um, this is what you would call um, the deepfake. Um, and yeah, so this is what we've seen for deepfakes. Um, for facial reenactments, this is the other category. Um, this is some of the work that we have been doing. This is face-to-face. -face. There was a very popular method we published at CVPR um, a couple of years ago. The idea here is we have a webcam um, recording him. We have a YouTube video here, and we're taking essentially his facial expressions to animate him here, YouTube video, right? Um, and as a result, um, you're going to get outputs that look like these ones. So his expressions here are going to transfer to his mouth at the end of the day. Now, since this is the media forensics workshop, I don't want to too much talk about how these methods um, work, technically speaking, how, how you can create these videos. But I wanted to talk a bit more about the implications. So how dangerous are these manipulations actually to begin with? And um, there's also, I think, a bunch of misconceptions, um, which I would like to clarify. So deep fakes, um, when you just go to, to Google, right, um, you uh, just type it in, um, you search what are deep fakes, um, you're going to get um, results that oh, look like these ones here, right? Um, so these kind of results, um, you know, they're more in the artistic, comical sense. So here's an example from Pin Screen, right? What these guys are doing, um, they, 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 they have these like, um, yeah, comical style of, uh, of deep fake videos, right? Or here we have also, if you look in here closely, yeah, it looks, it looks okay, but it doesn't look like extremely realistic, right? If you look in here very closely, you see a lot of blur on, on, on the edges. So it looks good. Um, but it also looks a little bit more in the in the in the fun zone, right? It's not like um, maybe not meant to be like seriously faking a speech or something like this. This is, um, but this is typically what deep fakes um, look like when you when you try to Google. Um, and you can go a step further. Um, I took a couple of more uh, deep fake images here. I took one from uh, Facebook's uh, deep fake detection challenge. 
um, they're showing results um, in their in the data set that looks like this one. So they have original um, videos here. And, I mean, I just copied the image here, but it, these are videos actually, right? Um, so they have the original image that looks like that, um, and the fake video looks something like that, right? Um, and so you see, you know, um, these are the, the, the two things side by side. Um, the one thing to be said is there's always a certain degree of how much manipulation you do. Um, so I did my own um, pseudo fake method, um, and what I did is I'm going to get results that look like these ones. So now if you're comparing the left one and the right one, um, we see the right one looks pretty pretty close to the, to, to the other one. Um, and my point, what I want to make here is, if I'm, for instance, not changing anything, I will get very realistic outputs because I didn't change anything. And in fact, this is actually the very same image that is here on the left. Um, and if I'm going back and forth, often what you see in these deepfake methods is, well, you know, there are some changes here. It looks like a low pass blur, basically. But there's not too much change on the person itself in this kind of specific example here, right? Um, again, if I'm going back and forth here, right? Like, look at this. This is the original, by the way, just to clarify. I just copied, just copied the original one here on the, on the right. Um, and my, my point is that there wasn't too much change, right? It looks like a little bit like makeup almost here on his head. Um, but the person doesn't look so dramatically different. And that's one of my points. Like, if you're trying out the deep fake methods, often you see there's very little change. Often it looks like some, some low pass blur. Sometimes there's more change, but then you see that it's obviously a fake. So there's obviously some, some question is, okay, how much do you manipulate and how much do you actually change? Um, so that doesn't mean that you can't change a lot, but it means that you have to be looking very carefully in terms of um, how much has actually been altered and manipulated, right? Um, so, you know, as I clarified right now is these deep fake methods, they actually don't change what the person is doing. They just, you know, again, they do, the mouth here is closed, right? And if I'm going back here, it's still a closed mouth. So it's not like I'm changing what the person is saying. I'm not changing the speech here. The only thing I'm changing is the appearance. So again, here it looks like a low pass blur, but sometimes you can, you know, if I'm going back here again, um, here to this one, right here, I copy pasted, it from, from me, but people have copy pasted basically a different face on top of this one and now you have a different person, but that person is still doing the same expressions what the original person he was doing, right? So it's not like, oh, this is a new speech or whatsoever. So this is not what deepfakes are doing. Um, so, you know, deepfakes are often in the context mentioned for, uh, you know, fake news and things like these, but I would say there's actually a much bigger challenge in terms of um, forgery. Um, and one thing, um, if you haven't guessed it by now, where the deepfakes are actually mostly used, um, is pornography. So this, I think, is a really big problem in practice um, if you're looking at these kind of methods, um, because what you can do now is you can take an arbitrary face and copy it on por pornographic material, and you can do basically revenge porn without even having you know, pornographic content of one person, you just post it on a different one. Um, and currently the estimate is that 99% roughly um, of all these deep fakes are appearing in pornographic material. Um, and I think this is actually a pretty big problem um, when you're considering, you know, the anonymity of internet um, and people want to wanna slander other people, right? And you can just um, think about high school mobbing, what students can do to each other. And this is a real danger, actually. And the, the problem here is, even if I, if I would know it as a fake, if I didn't know that, um, it wouldn't really change the harm that could be done with it. So this is actually a really big issue. We have to think about um, how to address, basically, social media platforms, for instance, they have to make sure um, to filter out these things that we um, get, get rid of them. Unfortunately, there's, of course, very sketchy websites, right, where, where this is not happening. So this is kind of a, a, an interesting, maybe, legislation issue, like how to deal with these kind of things. So this, this far, I've been talking about um, how deep fakes, aka facial uh, face swapping or identity swapping, um, is an issue. And I don't think it's an issue in this case for like making fake speeches, but rather thinking of, oh, you can basically discredit people and, you know, and certain faces and pornographic material and so on. Um, on the other hand, we have facial reenactment. This is a result from our normal texture paper, which we had last year at SIGRA. Um, in this case, what we do is we have here a source actor, right? Um, so Trump is being used as a source. Um, and basically the neural texture method impaints all these targets here. And this is then the resulted um, video by the AI. And the idea is, of course, that you know now we are in this realm where 
this video essentially controls the target video and now it's a little bit different because in this case it's not just you know changing the identity but it's making an existing person look like it's doing or saying something different again i'm not talking about the audio here but just the visual parts here and if i'm playing that it's going to look like that so look at the lip motion here and the head motion um, of this target video and why i i would really say clinton probably i would have to say clinton and why I mean, there was a little spirit I, frankly he would have been had he so he, and why i i would really say clinton. so here you can already see um you know this this, this could be potentially dangerous right um, because now we actually have uh, a target video that is being edited in retrospect and making it appear a different person is controlling that video. Um, of course, we have more examples here. Um, uh, we didn't just take uh, videos from politicians in the US. Um, we also did this with politicians in Europe, uh, specifically in Germany. That's where we're at right now. Um, and we can do some, some kind of fun videos with it. Um, we played a lot around with it, of course. I'm still the Terminator 30 years later, so that was really extraordinary. And I had a terrific time shooting this film because, again, it's like a combination of uh, being the powerful machine that would destroy anything uh, that would be in my way. But at the same time, I'm playing a protector. Okay, so this is, you know, this is the kind of stuff you can do. Um, the fun fact here is, of course, um, since we, we chose Angela Merkel here, who is the Chancellor of Germany, um, we did actually, in fact, um, get invited to a meeting with her, and we did actually show it to her. Um, there was no police coming. Um, we're all good. Um, in Germany, this is still fine. Um, you can do that to politicians at this point. Um, but, um, of course, you know, um, it was kind of a fun thing you could do with it. Um, we had more fun with it. Um, Trump was our favorite target at this point. Uh, here we used an IMU, right? And with this IMU, we could basically animate the face and we can create videos that look like these things. Um, we can do this, of course, not just with an IMU then. So and one of the very newest papers can do this with voice. Uh, and now you can see, you know, it's getting again a little bit more interesting. So here we're taking the, the voice input of, of Greta Thunberg um, and uh, we're using it to generate with a neural voice puppetry method, a very recent method actually, uh, uh, to, to create an animation sequence here of Trump. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. So if we're talking about this potential misuse that we're having in this case, um, we should actually make a clear distinction between facial reenactment and face swapping. So I wanted to talk about facial reenactment first. Um, because this is the thing what I've, I've shown at the end of the day. Um, so here, if we have an existing video and we can actually reanimate um, the facial motion, it appears that this person is saying potentially something different. I mean, I haven't talked about the audio right now, but from a given audio, right, you can change the video accordingly and make it more convincing for whatever purpose you want to use it for, so forth. So facial reenactment could potentially create fake speeches, right? And this is a big dangerous problem. Um, there's of course a lot of positives to it, but since this is a media forensics talk, I wanna, I wanna highlight the, the potential misuses of, of this technology, right? Um, and yeah, in this case, facial reenactment could be used for these kind of things. However, I should say, um, this is something that has been around not just for a few years, right? Um, it has been actually already started, um, like Chris Brackley, um, who, is, who is now at Google, um, has actually already started work like 20, 20 years ago, um, that was maybe not as photorealistic, but these methods up to this date, even after such a long development time, um, even in Chris did this uh, video rewrite paper, right? Um, these methods, they are still very, very hard to use and require a lot of expertise, right? You can't just go, um, like a novice can't just use these methods. And, and this is one thing that I think is very important. Um, one story that I'm hearing often is like journalists, for instance, they contact me and say, well, wow, we've seen these, these incredible videos. Um, don't you think this is a huge, a huge danger if everybody can use that? Um, and then they ask me, well, they say, well, we want to show how easy it is to use. Um, but we tried it out. It didn't work so well. But can you help us to make it show how easy it's to use? And I'm saying, yeah. But you're just proving the point that it is, in fact, not so easy because you need me to do it for you, right? Um, so we're not quite there yet, I think, in practice. And I think this is still going to take a few iterations um, to get there. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. 
of course, um, this will happen, but it will still take time, right? It is a gradual process. Um, of course, we have a lot of progress in GAN methods and so on. It's not quite there. Um, there's also the phase swapping, which again, this is something I would call the deep fake methods, um, is, is in my opinion, it's a little bit in a different realm, right? We have this interesting thing is this discussion, and, and I had this, I'm trying to explain this so many times. If you're taking a person A and taking a face of person B, and you're combining these two people, you obtain with a weird hybrid, you obtain with something like that. And everybody thinks like, oh my God, we can create fake videos. Yes, but by definition, these videos are not showing real people. This person does not exist. If I'm mixing two politicians together, this person will not exist. And I will know that it is not a real person making the speech. Um, so for like the fake news debate, I think deep fakes itself are not really such a big issue. But I already mentioned it, I think for high school mobbing, revenge pornography, this kind of stuff, this is something that is maybe not always in the media, um, but it should get more attention. This should be a big issue, like how do we deal with our digital identities um, on the web, right? So who can, who can manipulate me on the web and who can pr probably even discredit me, right, without me knowing? And I think this is something we have to discuss and we have to potentially find ways to address it. Um, in all of these methods, however, I see another, another big issue. Um, so this is a video, for instance, that has appeared in, in, in Germany quite a while. This was um, during the financial crisis uh, when the, the Greek financial minister, um, Mourofakis, he actually, there was a video appearing um, on the web, basically. He was showing um, a middle finger and he wanted to show the middle finger to Germany because Germany didn't want them, um, didn't want them to spend so much money. Um, so the video looks something like this, right? Um, there was one of these videos is fake and one of them is real. So this, this one is showing a middle finger, right? And this one is not showing a middle finger. And this created like a huge discussion um, whether this is real or whether this is a fake video, right? Um, but he said immediately, oh, this is not real. Um, and the fun thing is, right, um, at the end of the day, um, I'm not going to resolve it here. You can still have a look at it for a while. This is a very interesting story. Um, but at the end of the day, the fun thing was, it didn't really matter anymore whether this was a real video or not, right? There was so much discussion going on about it. And at the end of the day, there was so much, you know, insecurity. So people didn't know anymore what to believe. Um, this is this liar's dividend, right? At some point when you lie so many times, um, you can you can create fake facts, basically, right? <laughs> um, and this is the only, this is the the issue because people just they just tend to believe what they want to believe um, and and with visual media we have kind of this responsibility to address these these issues so even though i'm saying right now for instance the specific deep fake methods you know like it's hard to use for you know political campaigning or so in terms of making fake speeches i think there's a lot of problems with it um, and what we're seeing right now on social media is, is very much along these lines um, that there's basically people playing you know uh, playing each other like different groups and 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 making sure they 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 there's a lot of hate right and people um, they they react to it very emotionally. So the big question is actually from a computer vision perspective, from a media forensics perspective, can we reliably say is it a real video? Is it a fake video? And there has been a lot of research, um, and I would say I'm also a newcomer in this field. Um, there have been people who have been working on this for a long, long time. Um, can we reliably say is it fake? Is it real? And this is something we've been working on for a while now, a um, couple of years, um, whether uh, we can do this in these facial videos that we can also create at the same time. Um, and the first thing we thought of, well, you know, how how good, uh, how easy it is actually for humans to, to, to check, is it a real or is it a fake video? Um, and what we did is we had, a, we had a study with about 200 people, and these 200 people were actually computer science students, um, and we showed them a random series of images in this case, actually, and asked, do you think this is a real image? Do you think this is a fake image? Um, and the images we showed were either real or either fake with you know, one of our fake methods that we had at hand. Um, so we had different methods to detail. I'm not gonna go into it right now, but basically there were a couple of um, different combinations there. Um, but what's interesting is um, the data set distribution here was 50-50. So we had half of them are real, half of them are fake. So if I'm just randomly guessing, I'm gonna get a 50-50 chance and I would be here in the middle. Um, if I'm showing them high quality images, and high quality means high resolution, um, no compression artifacts, right? Um, 
then people got like, you know, 70% accuracy here in terms of deciding whether it's real or it's not real. 70% on a binary chance, by the way, is not very good, <laughs> especially given that the quality was here pretty, pretty high. Um, if we're starting to compre <coughs> compress the images and downsampling the whole thing a little bit, um, we will see uh, that, this, that this accuracy here goes actually quite down. This was, I think, 55-ish percent at the end. Um, basically random, right? I mean, on the binary task, if you get 55%, that's like nothing. There's almost no signal here. Um, and this is like, well, we realized very quickly, like people just can't tell real or fake apart. And this goes a little bit back to also what I've shown before. Um, it depends, of course, how much you change in the videos and so on. Um, but in the end of the day, these were all videos where we changed quite something. Um, and the methods were convincing enough. If you compress it, if you downsize it enough, you're actually going to get, um, yeah, you're going to get pretty random answers. So, well, the obvious research question was, um, can we develop methods that do this automatically, right? I mean, without relying on human experts, the thought process is, oh, can we train neural networks? Can we train AI um, to detect if it's real or not? And this is like this, this phase forensics direction um, that I would say is now relatively popular in this, in this field. Um, uh, yeah, this is something that is, uh, um, is something we've been doing. Um, and in this case, we actually try to first see, well, what kind of data do we need to train in neural networks? And what we thought is um, we needed, we wanted to have a lot of variety. So we took not only one method, but we took the deep fake method, right? Uh, this is like a face swapping technique. We took another a graphics based face swapping technique that was available before. Um, we took face to face, that's a reenactment technique. And we took neural textures, that's also a reenactment technique, right? Um, um, also to say like, Deep fakes and neural textures are both neural network techniques for forgery creation, and face swap and face to face are graphics based methods for forgery creation, right? So we had kind of a variety between, like, okay, two of them were facial reenactment, two of them were, were identity swapping, and two of them were graphics, and two of them were deep learning based. Um, we took a thousand videos, um, 500k frames. Um, so if you're taking all of them together, we then ended up with um, 4,000 manipulated videos, right? Uh, we have over 2 million manipulated frames. We have the original ones. Um, we have a train validation test split. Um, we have a reasonable distribution in terms of gender, um, resolution, pixel coverage of faces. So we made sure we had enough coverage here. Um, and yeah, so these ones are actually uh, publicly available. A lot of people have been using it. I don't know the exact numbers. We probably have like 3K downloads or so from research groups at this point. Um, we have uh, yeah, we have manipulated frames, we have uh, three compression levels, um, and so, you know, you can simulate what's more on social media and so on. Um, yeah, this is 2,000 right now. This is a bit of an outdated number. I think it's like 3,000 at this point. Um, we also got some, some data set donations um, in addition to the original data. So Google, for instance, gave us the deepfake detection data set. That's another 3,000 videos. They were specifically for deepfakes. Um, they used a little bit of a different deepfake method. Um, but it was very interesting to us because um, it, get, it created more variety to the original method. So um, they had uh, 28 actors, which is relatively low, but they had a large number of combinations between how to face swap which uh, image on which one, right? Um, and then what we did is um, we, um, we thought, you know, what's most reasonable? First thing is we take an input image, we detect the face, um, we crop the face region, um, and then we trained a neural network, we took the best neural network we thought was there. It was an exception that at the time that we had our hands on. We trained a binary classifier to say, is it a real or is it a fake video, right? Um, and, I mean, academically, it seems pretty straightforward, right? We had um, the most effort we spent was curating the data that we had actually, um, uh, like these, these data splits and so on, um, and created all of this data. Uh, and then we compared the results what we got. Um, this was what the humans uh, were getting, right? Again, we had like 70-ish percent for high quality, uh, for good quality, and then for like social media style quality, we had like 55% accuracy, which was pretty bad. Um, if we look at the results of our networks that we got, um, on the good quality, we got basically 99%. Um, this was something we were like, hmm, yeah, okay, this can detect this stuff pretty reliably. Um, and... Yeah, on lower quality, when you compress it and when you go down with the images, um, again, if you don't change much in the lower resolution at some point, if you have a 5 by 5 uh, pixel image, right, you can't detect anything anymore. This is still better, but basically, of course, we only can detect um, 70, 76. So these numbers are not state-of-the-art anymore. 
Um, we released, in fact, the benchmark um, and also asked um, the community kind of to contribute. Um, we got a lot of submissions to our benchmark um, that is featuring a hidden test set with all of this variety of different methods. Um, I'm just quoting the top numbers here. So the very top number here is currently uh, 0.84. Um, so, you know, that's, a little, that's better, of course, than our, our 76 or whatever we had here. Um, that's quite something, right? Um, I mean, I wouldn't... So, so th these numbers here on the low quality. On the high quality, this is already solved, right? If you have high enough quality, you can detect very reliably, is it a fake or is it a real image with, uh, or video in this case, right? Um, so this one sounds all pretty good. So the supervised ways in order to detect, is it a fake or is it another fake? Um, on the benchmark right now, we get to 84% here. Um, is actually super promising. I mean, you see there's a bit of different uh, <laughs> different accuracy between different methods. And neural textures is harder to detect. That's one of our newest methods that I would say looks pretty good, visually speaking. Um, the deep fakes here, they're relatively easy to detect because the quality is not so high most of the times. This is the deep fake face swapping method. Um, but yeah, so this sounds all pretty promising. And um, people told me, you know, I, I mean, I told them, you know, if you have a method, right, you can create a lot of training data, and then um, you want to detect is it created with this method or not, and versus everything else. Um, I told them it's a really easy task, right, because um, you only have to get one pixel wrong, and so the detection in principle is much, much easier than the generation. So in this case, you would say, hmm, well, wait a second. So basically that says, oh, we can detect the deep fakes and everything else at a super high reliable uh, accuracy. Why isn't that being used all over the time? So this sounds all a little bit too good to be true. Um, and there's always one caveat what I'm saying. Whenever I'm saying that is, um, well, we can train pretty strong neural networks that can detect something as long as we have enough data of that specific method we want to detect. So what's going to happen in practice, our neural networks, they overfit heavily, heavily, heavily on the method and the data set. So I wanted to just show one example here, um, picking the method part here, right? So the idea is if you're training on one fake method, how well is that network performing on a different fake method? Um, and they got amazing results, which look like these. So if you're training on face-to-face -face manipulated um, uh, images, you're gonna get a 90% accuracy if you test on face-to-face. -face. If you train on face-to-face -face but test on face swap, you're gonna get a 50-50 split. In other words, we have almost zero transferability between these methods here. If you're training on face swap and testing on face-to-face, -face, we have 52. It's a little better, but it's still random, right? I mean, these 50 is like this transferability between the methods is almost non-existent. Um, and this problem got really worse because what we thought is, hmm, we want to use really, really good neural networks, right? We want to have very powerful, strong neural networks with a lot of weights, like exception into the big network. Um, then we're getting this number here, quite high. Like these 98, this is on the high quality data, right? We're getting these numbers pretty high. Um, the stronger we made this network, the higher these numbers got, the lower these other two numbers got, which was interesting, right? So if you're using a weaker network, this number, of course, gets lower, this number gets a little bit higher. So we had this interesting trade-off, transferability versus how good on the actual task. Um, so in other words, what we're doing here right now, um, we, we're facing the, the classical problem in computer vision. We're having a data set and we're trying everything possible to be good on this data set, but we're ignoring maybe the real practical problem. And this is something that needs to be addressed. And here we listed it out for the method and for the data set, it's exactly the same thing. If you're training on one data set that was created with one specific pipeline and then testing on like in the wild videos or whatsoever, then we have a massive drop in performance. And for forgery detection, this is even worse because basically these networks, they look at low level features and low level artifacts that the methods create and so on, right? So they totally overfit to them. And if the pipeline slightly changes, these features are not so reliable anymore. Um, and we have another example, um, and this is basically confirmed um, by the Facebook's challenge too, um, which we see here as part of the workshop. So um, the Facebook deep, deep fake detection challenge, so what they're doing is they're providing only from one method, right? Um, but they're providing a lot of videos. This is in terms of absolute videos, they have a lot of videos, but they don't have a lot of variety, so they only have a single method. Um, and then they put the data out um, and let people compete on a Kaggle competition in order to get good classification results there. So in the public data said, you know, the best performing models they achieved something like 82.5% average precision. Um, so, you know, that's on the, on the same data, basically. Um, it's in domain. Um, but again, it's only one method at this point. And now if you're changing the data set, 
um, going to a black box data set, the average precision, the top model, an average precision went down to 65%. That's like, it's pretty low, right? It's a binary task. Um, and it's the same thing here, right? I mean, it doesn't drop so dramatically between methods. Between methods, it drops to 50. And between data sets, it drops to 65, right? It's like zero generalizability in terms of methods and zero generalizability in terms of data sets. So and in this case, I think it was even more extreme um, of an example because what happens in these capable competitions, you want to be good at the data sets that are available to you. So of course, you're using super strong networks. Um, and the stronger the networks, the more they overfit to the action data they have. And, and this is a real problem, right? Um, and it's also just a single method, right? So this is a big, big challenge, I think, um, as a community. So I think on one hand, well, it's good that Facebook also invested the effort. But in practice, I think we need more variety in terms of methods to make it interesting in any remotely practical scenario, right? This is a purely, a purely hypothetical academic scenario with one method and one type of data. Um, like in terms of doing any practical forgery detection, this is not usable. If you have a, if you have a billion images uploaded a day um, and you only, and, and for, for basically half of them, you're making wrong predictions, um, that's just not practical. But I'm not, I'm not just saying this about Facebook. I'm just saying this about our own research too. It's the same thing, right? If you have no generalizability between methods, it's pretty problematic because every pipeline might be slightly different. Again, binary task, keep that in mind. So one thing we are currently doing in my lab, um, we're trying to address specifically that problem, right? We want to make sure that we do actually generalize between both methods and data sets. Um, and um, yeah, research-wise speaking, this leads to few-shot um, and zero-shot transfer learning approaches. Um, and we had one very recent paper um, that's done by Bania Shivangi. She's a new PhD student in my lab. Um, um, she's been working on a method basically where the idea is um, you want to go ahead and in a source domain, um, you want to find a multimodal distribution. So every class should be one mode in this distribution. And now what we want to do is um, we want um, to find to separate out these distribution between the different classes as much as we can. Like rather than using a single classifier, we're mapping a first good distribution. Um, and then in the target domain, when you do fine tuning, you just have to find, um, you just have to use this pre-trained encoder here, and you have to fine tune this encoder to say, well, in the new um, domain, um, you're mapping, you're mapping um, the respectively to one of these modes from the previous one, right? And this is significantly easier than just training as uh, an existing classifier. Um, yeah, and I mean, at test time, you just check in which of the modes you end up, right? Um, so this kind of um, formulating as a, as, a, as a proper distribution that you're explicitly learning, in this case, we have a loss that says, oh, take these two distributions apart, in this case, of the two classes, right? Um, and um, map the respective target domain, either in the zero shot or in the few uh, shot case, to these modes. Um, and I'm not going into all the technical details here. Um, this is still, um, it's still unpublished work. Um, but the results are actually quite encouraging. So here we have essentially a graph that shows the performance of the zero and future transfer. So here we have the ac ac accuracy, right? 100% um, would be great. We're not quite there, of course. Um, and here on the x-axis, we show how many images did we use for fine tuning in the target domain. Uh, and this is a future case that goes from null textures um, to deep fakes. So it's going from one method to another method. This is between two methods. Um, in this case, the zero here is, of course, the zero shot case, right? Um, and this is a bunch of baselines here. And this, uh, uh, this is ours, DDT. Um, this is the naive classifier. So you see all of the baselines here. These are some existing domain uh, adaptation methods here. They get like 70%, um, uh, they get like 70 accuracy. So the problem is the existing domain adaptation methods don't work so well because they typically rely on having a lot of classes. And in our case, we only have two classes. so we tailored this distribution basically specifically to that case. Um, but in any case, um, we get close to 80% uh, in terms of um, the zero shot transferability. And then when we use um, 100 images, we get already to 90. So you could assume, right, we have a couple of images from the new uh, method or new data set that we want to detect. Um, and I think this is relatively encouraging. So we have quite a performance gap here between the baselines and between what we're doing. This was the state-of-the-art baseline um, uh, forensics transfer. This also um, was a collaboration with uh, University of Naples and with uh, Annalisa Bergmaliba, who's also giving a talk um, in the workshop. Um, but basically, this one is currently the state-of-the-art in terms of transferability. 
So the good news here is essentially um, we getting if we're focusing specifically on the domain transfer, right? With these kind of new methods, we're having a better chance to generalize than using just a naive classifier. Um, the bad news is the numbers are still not as high as we thought, right? Like it's still 80 or close to 80. That's for the zero shot case, yeah, it should be higher, right? If you only have, if you're still missing 20% here, that's quite something. Um, but what's interesting about it, there's the two axes we can basically look at. One part is the methods, and one part is the data sets. So methods, I'm, I mentioned, this is why, why face forensics has so many different methods. We have now with the Google data set, basically, uh, we have five methods. Um, and we're encouraging every company to help us grow this bigger. Um, in fact, we're currently in discussion with Microsoft, so they want to also donate some data to us um, out of the, um, from Microsoft Research um, from the, the very recent um, uh, paper from this year's CVPR, um, so we can have another method, right? So the idea is the more methods we have, the better we in terms of generalizability. Um, same thing counts for the data sets. Even though they were almost created with the same methods, you still have different settings of the video. So in this case, we have uh, uh, we used Face Forensics Plus Plus, we used Google Deepfake Detection, DESA is another interesting data set, Cell Deepfake data set, and this is a data set that was donated to us by, by the AI Foundation, and this is like a, a, a startup um, in San Francisco. Um, they um, worked with us for quite a while, and um, from them they had completely in the wild videos. So these are super challenging, we're going to release them, and also, also going to add them to our data. Um, so we have even more variety. These ones are really challenging to detect. This is what you basically find on the web when you type in deepfakes. Um, so I think this is pretty interesting. So the conclusions here so far are, um, well, positive and negative. If we're having if we're having a supervised task and we have enough data from one given method, we're gonna get pretty good results. Um, but the neural networks, um, yeah, they're great for this task. We all know that, right? That's what we're doing all the time. Whenever we're reporting numbers in the paper, we're always happy, we're patting on our shoulders, done a great job um, training our neural networks. But that is still a very different story on how well these kind of things work in practice, right? Um, this is a thing we have to discuss. So this generalization to new data sets and new methods is an extremely, extremely, extremely hard problem. So what we have experienced so far, and again, not of all of this published yet, um, but training on more data sets helps. So if you not just use a single data set, this helps. Augmentation methods here help too. Um, it's not surprising, right? Regularize it, we don't overfit to, to data specific features, but rather try to generalize. Um, training on more forgery methods also helps. Um, um, more in this case means maybe four or five because we don't have more, um, but with more methods um, being around um, and people um, researchers making it available to us and allowing us to, to, to add it to the face forensics plus plus data set, right? Um, we hope that we're getting more methods and then with more methods, hopefully we also get, um, you know, better performance in terms of generalizability. Like what is the channel feature um, between these fake methods? That's what we're looking for. Um, the domain adaptation methods, and one of them I briefly went over, um, I think they're pretty good. Um, they're not going to solve it alone, but they're going to get you another like 10, 20% maybe. Um, and that might be the difference to make it actually usable, right? We're not at the end of the line here. We still need to work on this quite a bit. Um, but I think, you know, the, the delta we're achieving right now is, is quite substantial to naive classification. Um, there's a bit of a larger question, which I'm conveniently ignoring. Um, how many internalizable features do we actually have, right? I mean, this is a fundamental question. Like, what's the fundamental, what's the, 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 the best optimum we can achieve with these? Like, if we have an infinite amount of fortune methods, at some point, we have to make a decision. What is a forgery method and what is a real method? Um, so in, in how, how these generalizable features interact and so on is, in my opinion, um, it, is, it is a challenge, right? Um, we don't know that. Um, but so far, the trend in the gradient um, is pretty good. Um, again, the domain adaptation methods we've been working on, the zero-shot transfer and future transfer um, method we came up with works much better than before. But it's, of course, no one so. And the hope is, once we're combining it now with more methods and more data sets, we're getting even better results. Um, but again, this is still ongoing research, and I think at this point we have to be very clear that, um, yeah, I mean, if you have one method you want to detect it, you're great, we can ship that in principle, and we thought about doing that. Um, but then we realized, well, if there's some small deviation of the method, right, you're going to have issues, and that's why we need this generalizable. Okay, um, before I'm ending the talk, I wanted to say another small interesting thing. And this is a misconception that I've also seen a couple of times. 
So every discussion about deep fakes is not equal to fake news, right? We have to be very clear here. All the things we've discussed here was manipulations of facial videos. Um, and this is a problem that emerged mainly due to the research advances in terms of creating facial forgeries, right? Like methods like face-to-face, -face, neural textures, all the deep fakes. We have seen a lot of high quality um, videos of faces. Um, but this is far away, like let's say we detected them all perfectly. This would not necessarily solve the fake news problem. In fact, I would say at this point, it doesn't even, it doesn't even poke it, right? Um, so even if Facebook figures out, or Google, if they all figure out how to perfectly detect all of these videos, this is not addressing the fake news problem. Um, and most of the fake news has nothing to do with videos at the moment. In fact, it's actually way too economically, too expensive to create fake videos. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a machine learning expert. You know how much money these guys make, right? Um, it, it's just not practical. What's much easier is you're taking an image and you're adding a different caption. So this is a real image of a boat with a lot of people on it. And this is a very real example that came in 2015, was spread on social media, um, especially in Germany and European countries, um, you know, to, to kind of to create hatred across um, against refugees. So what turned out is, um, so this was shared, um, including by, by right-wing members of the parliament, for instance, in Belgium. Um, so they shared this image and said, Syrian refugees invading Europe will end up replacing Europeans. And, you know, like, of course, people went wild. They're like, oh, God, how could we let this happen? Um, and what turns out, of course, is this image had nothing to do with Syrian refugees. So what happened then afterwards is people try to clarify. So the next thing that came up, same imagery, right? Um, same setting. Um, not Syrian refugees or African immigrants trying to enter Europe. Europeans fleeing to North Africa in World War II. Again, same image. I just translated this one here. Again, this one has 90, 96 million likes, I think, right? Um, so quite substantial. Um, and this went in the other way right now. It's like, oh yeah, okay, so now, the, so this one was basically here, here it's all, all, all the Syrian Africans come to Europe. Here it's now, it's all the Europeans are now fleeing to Africa, same imagery. Um, and it turns out this one is fake too. Um, what turns out, this is actually, um, it's a ship from Al Albania, um, the port city of Dres, um, right? And the, there are migrants on board, but it has nothing to do with um, Europeans, Africans, or whatsoever, right? It had nothing to do with it. The only thing that was changed here um, was the caption. Um, and what I'm trying to make clear here is you don't have to create wrong visuals. You have, just have to take an image and you have to take it out of context and place a different caption in it. And for all kind of fake news that exists right now, the most common thing is exactly that, right? You just take an image, you post a different caption underneath, don't have to edit anything. It takes way too much effort, right? And, and create hatred in this way. And this is a bigger problem, I think, in, at the moment. And we have to think about, um, you know, like what's the real issue here? Um, yeah, just to clarify, again, um, Albania is actually in Europe, right? Albania is here next to Italy. Um, so these were migrants, right? But they were in 1991 um, from Albania coming to Italy within Europe. Um, so this is, I think, a very important thing, like how we how we talk about these kind of deep fake discussions, right? This is currently, in my opinion, a bigger issue. Um, we should also focus a lot on the research here. We should think about how can we address these kind of things. And we will really quickly see it's going to be a bit more tricky um, than just running a binary classifier here and saying, oh, it's a real or fake image. Here we have to check, is that caption matching this image? How do we know that? I mean, prominence is a big, big thing, right? Like, where do the images come from? Um, do we know the origin of the images? Once we know the origin of the images, things get a lot easier. Like, uh, big companies like Google and Facebook, they have potential resources to do that, right? If you have enough images at some point, you can figure out where they come from. Um, you can look at social media network graphs, like Twitter is doing that. Right? Um, you can try to follow how things, how news is being propagated, um, stuff like that. So I, I encourage everybody to think a little bit beyond the single classifier too. Right? You have to think about um, how we go there. I also wanted to show about um, some positives. Um, the reason is um, we actually do a lot of research also um, in terms of making use of these technologies, like deep fakes, like facial reenactment methods. What can we do with it? Um, and 
I think one of the, the, the key things why we actually started this is, of course, we didn't want to create fake speeches, right? Like, um, this is not interesting, um, academically speaking. Um, we wanted to actually do real-time translation and showing people communicate across different languages. So I wanted to show one of the examples here. This was um, a video that was created by uh, Synthesia. That's a startup where I'm co-founder with. Um, and we basically had David Beckham um, work with us. Um, and it was a campaign against malaria. And he wanted to speak in different languages um, with the help of AI-based dubbing. And um, I wanted to quickly show the video here. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Mais nous pouvons y mettre fin. Nous savons comment, nous en avons la possibilité. Speak up and say, malaria must die. One voice can be powerful, but all of our voices together, then they will have to listen. Malaria must die, so millions can live. Yeah, I think this is probably a good ending, so I just wanted to highlight, you know, like there's still a lot of positive potential between these technologies and why we should work on them. Like having seamless, um, virtual communications across languages is one of the things. And again, this video was completely um, created with AI. Um, this is something that we should definitely keep in our minds. And um, I hope we can we can always and not forget um, there's a lot of positive things along with it. So with that, I would like to um, come to the conclusion. Um, I thank everybody for watching. Um, I'm not yet sure how the questions are handled. I'll probably ask anything you want in the in the comments on social media. Um, I'm very, very happy to, to, to answer. Also, if you want to reach out to me and want to know more, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, uh, yeah, thanks a lot.